Welcome to Neuro Movement Revolution with Anat Benyel, where you will discover breakthrough possibilities for your life through the brain's power to change. We're so happy that you can join us in making the impossible possible. Okay, so hello, hello. I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Christina Bethel. Christina, I am so, so happy to, to see you and to have you on this call. I know, it, I know it's going to be an amazing gift for my, my people. So, <laughs> and for me, by the way, too. So I'm going to introduce you because uh, even though the work you have done thus far and you're doing currently is magnificent, you know, life and society changing and transformational for so many people. You have done it more in the academic and policy, mm -hmm. uh, government policy area. So you're, you're, at least in my community, you're not a well-known name. Right. In your professional area, you are the leader. So I'm so thrilled for people to get to, to know you, to begin to know you and to know your work. So... Christina Bethel, PhD, MBA, and MPH, is a professor at John Hopkins University in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she advances a new integrated science of thriving. I'm gonna say that again, science of thriving. I love that. To promote early and lifelong health of children, youth, families, and communities. Dr. Bethel is an avid student of human potential for flourishing amid adversity. Again, it is human potential for flourishing amid uh, adversity and focuses on promoting research and innovation in health, education and social systems, policies and practices to promote the social, emotional and relational roots of well-being. She advances a positive construct of health that places mindfulness and mind-body practices as key public health strategies, especially to address the developmental and collective trauma held by the majority of people, families, and communities today. Her work is focused on implementing a widely endorsed national agenda to address childhood trauma and promote healing and flourishing through research, advocacy, and teaching. She writes poetry, dances, and believes that attuned connection with ourselves, life, and others is the source of our creativity and joy. What a beautiful short description of you and your amazing work. So the title, the work, as you said, working title of this conversation, yeah. this interview and conversation, is we are we try to change it and it didn't change. So I'm announcing it to everyone. We are the medicine, prioritizing possibilities to mitigate childhood trauma and promote healing and flourishing. Mm -hmm. So Christina, I think if you don't mind briefly, I think your story, how you started when you were a college student. Mm -hmm. The story of your initial interest, caring, love, and passion, and just uh, if you can just give it like the skeleton of what brought you to where you are today. Oh, wow. That's great. I didn't know you were going to ask me that, but I love it. Um, yeah, I, you know, was very active as a child, just noticing a lot of suffering around me among people who didn't have illness and a lot of well-being among people who did. And I was curious about what that was about. And it just seemed to me that it was about the relationships and a sense of connectedness that we had. And so I got very involved in volunteering in nursing homes and really trying to be a part of the community just instinctively and that sort of thank God. And um, I was working in a nursing home when I was 16 and I couldn't get this woman who I loved Goldie into the park because they didn't have any that, that basically it wasn't meant for people with disabilities. And so I wrote, I did a study, wrote the steps out, I interviewed her, made a case to the Chamber of Commerce, and basically they changed it. And so I got the bug that by recognizing what we could possibly do to improve well-being, making the case for it through data and story, 
and advocacy, we can actually change things. And that was a very empowering experience for me that I took into UCLA where I led a lot of the peer health work where peer to peer counseling and raising our awareness and education about like using imagination about what was possible for us and taking charge of our lives. And basically it just went from there trying to shape the health system in those in ways that could bring forth what I knew instinctively were possibilities for well-being sort of shocked about, of course, the medical model and the long route I had to take to get enough data to be able to show a number of things through research about how we could really change um, our systems, which means changing our payment and incentives and our insurance benefits. And so somehow I've got, you know, deep into the muck of what does it actually take to bring this science that we know, the science of thriving, I call, but of, you know, we really aren't up to date in our medical or public health systems with what we know about child development, human development, and human potential. So that's just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the part that you told that, you know, some of it to me many years ago when we first met, and I know that you used to, to go out at night and, and find homeless parents, moms and children. Yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> because for me, it's so heroic. It's so... Uh, it's amazing. Well, I just felt like no one talked to the people and that what they needed the most was to be heard and seen and known. And that when that happened, all of a sudden there was an, an instinct to participate in the resources that were being offered. One of the biggest challenges we have is trying to help people who we think need help who don't want to be helped. <laughs> Basically, they're not responsive, you know. So the self-care instinct seemed to be deactivated through trauma and all of the identities that we shape around ourselves or the stigma or the shame or the just being worn out. So, but it seemed really easy to activate hope and optimism and possibility when people were related to with care and then could be supported to actually move out of those circumstances with the resources that were actually available. Wonderful, amazing, amazing. So I have a few questions here that the mm -hmm. I, I, you know, we discuss these possibilities and we can take it anywhere. I mean, there's okay. not, so what, given what you see in the research for children with special healthcare needs and their families, mm -hmm. by the way, before I say it, I think that you were the person that got, I don't know how it's called, it's a kind of long name. Family medical leave app? No, the, the no. statistics, the statistic, uh, you know, the yeah. survey. Mm -hmm. How, yeah. how um, well, we didn't, if you don't have data, you can't really make a case that anything, how everything is for kids with, and families with special needs or what to do. So I had to basically go to the beginning and define with the authorities and groups, what is a child with special health care needs? And therefore, how do you actually identify children with special health care needs so that then we can assess their needs, their health, and the system's performance on their behalf? And so basically we had no data when I started my career. And now we have a lot of data because of the measurement and the ability to get the data collected nationally and for all states. So that's kind of what, where I began out of a huge passion for families and children with disabilities. Yeah, I mean, this is an incredible undertaking in a sense, you made the special, children with special needs exist. In the, well, the data, yeah, the data and the measures we use to make yes. that policy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because up until then, you know, mm -hmm. of course, people knew there are some kids with trouble, but nobody, mm -hmm. there was no way right. to, to push any policy or any right. systematic, uh, in you know, approaches and interventions. Right. And that is also the basis from which you can continue and create so much more. I mean you're revolutionizing and you're disrupting the system but you're also creating the system so yeah it's, it's i'm so grateful but you know it's really about connecting with the families and measuring things through their experience and their lens because that's the goal is to reach families so my the screening tools are consequences based not disease based so it's not conditions and diagnoses it's whether there's a consequences for an ongoing health issue the system may or may not have diagnosed it they may have diagnosed it wrong. You may have a diagnosis just to get insurance coverage, but it's really meant to be family-driven identification and then reporting on health and outcomes, which is really the most valid way to do it. And we can go into that. So yeah, we now have a lot of data and that's what really um, you know, 
made me realize how much variation there is and how children and families are doing with similar levels of uh, supposed adversity and illness. Mm -hmm. And that what was that about? Yeah. So, so you said something that uh, I will come in a little bit and elaborate. We say you're not disease or based approach and, uh, but you are consequences or outcomes, what I'd call outcomes of, yeah, yeah outcomes based. Anyway, so let's go to this question. Given what you see in the research for children with special healthcare needs and their families, what about our work? You know, an advanced yeah. method neuro movement caught your interest, even in the beginning of our relationship, uh, which was by now, I think 14 years ago or something, mm -hmm. you introduced me to the president of Family Voices, an association for families of children with special needs. Yeah, so and I think she did your training, right? Um, she took yeah, she took my training. Yeah, she, yeah. It, it changed completely her relationship with her son. So first of all, you know, all the work I do starts with qualitative research, working with actual families and their lived experiences, and then translating that into theories and hypotheses and measurements. And what I noticed was that a lot of what was struggling, families were struggling with was stress and the difficulty to connect and have positive emotional interactions with their, their children and with themselves and their own inner processes of their own self-care and then in their relationships. And that that seemed to be the thing that was really missing was any sense of being seen, heard or known by the system as a whole person, a whole child, a whole family so that they could work together and partner. And so that really informed the formulation of the measures that we use. And can, I slow, that, can I slow you down a little yeah. bit? Because mm -hmm. you're saying such important things and, you know, people who are not familiar might not be able to process. So you, you are looking at the relationships between the adults and the child and other relationships. And what else did you say that gives you the basis? Can you slow yeah, down? Yeah, we just noticed that what families were saying made up the difference when they were doing better or not or getting good health care or not that it centered a lot on relationships. And okay. when you wind into that, it had a lot to do with the capacity to be present mm. and regulated. And they weren't using those words, but then the science of, you know, the neurosciences were really showing a lot about, you know, the effects of trauma and difficulty and stress that accumulates over time, which is often the case for families of children with special health care needs who are often sent in 20 different directions in the system with a lot of fear about how their child's going to do. And really no one knows them well. Sometimes there's a specialist that does, but it's a body part by body part kind of thing. And so what I really was launching was you know, a model of care that would really provide that relational basis and a whole child, whole family approach that really anchored in partnership and shared decision-making. And when that happened, other things emerged that families needed that weren't so high tech and that seemed to be having a difference. So even for kids with CF or CP, there's huge variation in how children diagnostically the same, supposedly the same severity were doing that had to do with how the family was able to function and stay connected even through adversity to each other and stay in relationship. And so that really relates to your work because for me, that took me in the direction of studying the neurobiology of connection, which is really talked about a lot in those days around mindfulness, but really presence, which is a felt embodied experience, not a idea. And that really this, you know, biosynchrony that happens between a parent and a child, it's the basis of attachment. It's the basis of our own regulation. And yet it wasn't happening. And so that neurologic disturbance of not having actually connection so that we can, as you say, turn on the learning switch seemed just really obvious to me. And so, so much of what your principles were were really reflective of what I was hearing families say was working for them when things were going better. Mm. And so that's part of, part of what's happening now is we know a lot of children who are hospitalized a lot 
that when it when they stopped having to have those repeat hospitalizations, it's because there was an attention to the social and relational and stress factors that are in the lives of the family. Really empowering parents and children to stay connected and to be resourceful, practice resilience. And, you know, of course, the treatments that you have keep people, people moving. And there's actually, if you look at the research, a lot of sedentary lifestyles, even just movement for exercise among families with children with special needs, with only about 11% meeting really basic criteria for flourishing. But when you introduce interventions that start to build skills and capacities like you teach, it, go, it increases by four or five times. It's just that what's being taught are skills for how to be, not necessarily medical intervention. Yeah, not to look to fix the child directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there are things we need to do. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, we I mentioned it to you, we just started uh, three months ago, maybe, you know, after maybe already four doing what we call uh, at home, neuro movement at home uh, mm -hmm. coaching. Right. Uh, but the coaching is of the parents. Right. And, just, and of course they, they ask us to come on because they have a child with, I mean, we also work with adults, but that's done differently. It depends how functional the adult is, but with the mm -hmm. children, it's always the adults. Right. And getting the adults to change. That's How right. do they do what they already do with the child based on the, you know, nine essentials and shifting from That's fixing right. to connecting. And it's amazing how potent it is, how powerful, how transformational it is. And even though the names, the titles of the essentials are really straightforward and simple to yeah. actually be the essentials, to do them, to generate them through the way they relate and they act, you know, with themselves and the child is not obvious. And even just when they get some of it, I'd say 10, 15 percent, yeah. the children start flourishing, like you say. Well, it's like what I was saying. It doesn't take a lot. It's amazing how responsive our brains and bodies are to positive inputs yeah. that recognize what we need. And so reducing the sources of stress, certainly we need to do, but more importantly, building those relational self-care, relational skills. And, um, you know, I call it your being, their well-being. Mm. And so the be well-being of the being and the well-being of the parents is directly related to the well-being of the child. And so that's what our research actually shows at a population basis. So, so much of this is obvious to many people, but we have to actually show it epidemiologically and in a national survey at the state level so that policymakers will pay attention and not just think that it's an off one-off case. So when you see that building family resilience and parent coping and that there's emotional support and importantly, parent-child connection, which we define in various ways, but one of the main ways is actually being together when things are hard is the strongest predictor of child flourishing, even if they have special needs and their ability to be curious and interested in learning to whatever level their minds will let them being able to persist and not give up on activities, like whether it's walking or eating or doing schoolwork if they do schoolwork, and being able to stay enough calm and in control when faced with a challenge that they reach out for help instead of just collapsing in or acting out and regulating inside of adversity to let in, to keep an open system. And so those three things, even though they sound simple, only 40% of children in the country meet those criteria, and only 11% of children with special health care needs. However, there are huge variations that really get predicted by whether the family and the parent have their own resilience and that connection with the child. It's, it's incredible. You know, as you're saying it, and you look at it with a epidemiological point of view, national point of view, sometimes I believe when it leaks into international and or could. And I, I have images coming to me just from yesterday, I think it was yesterday that, yeah, yeah, I think it was yesterday that I worked with this family 
and, uh, and the mother is a physician, the father is a businessman, and lovely parents with a child that was born with, with difficulties, let's just say it this way, without going too much detail. And what came up again and again with him, but it comes with so many parents, and it took me a while to, to get the distinction clear. I see the child different than they see the child. Because one thing that I'm sure you're aware of, and I don't know how much you work with directly, is when a child has you know, medical issues or, or mm -hmm. developmental issues, it's extremely traumatic to the parents. Right. And they get re-traumatized on a daily basis over and over again, every time they confront you know, the, the situation basically. So it's, it's not like a bad week and then it's over. Right. It's like it's over and over and over again. But the initial trauma is usually when there's a, and the most profoundly is when the, there is the initial emergency or discovery, you know, you get the diagnosis or something. And they don't know it, but they relate to the child and, and interact with the child, seeing them through the filter of their original trauma. Right. I come into the picture sometimes a few weeks later, sometimes a few years later, and I see a very different picture. I mean, I see right. what's going on and I see what's needed. And to just shift the parents mm -hmm. to, to be able to separate even for a moment from their own anxiety and their need to control and make sure that the kid doesn't die or mm -hmm. in their mind's eye, right? Now it's in their yeah. mind's eye. Um, is is big deal, but it's mostly to start seeing the possibilities and the right. strength and the intelligence in the child. That doesn't right. mean you pretend they don't need help. Right. And, and that's really the mindset set shift that we're talking about is that's why I call it prioritizing possibilities. It's a mindset. And one of the practices I do work with families of children with special health care needs, especially to figure out how can we really change the system on their behalf. But, um, you know, one of the things I do is I call finding the jewel, which is that when you're upset, always it's because of something you love or care about. Like you wouldn't be upset unless there was something you loved that you felt was threatened. And so to be aware of that, you take the immediate, every time you're upset, you go right to the love and to the care and let that inform the anxiety and it makes just enough of a shift that you can start to, you know, not get out of that habituated process because trauma takes a big hit. And I've had families many times, they don't talk to me about my trauma. Like I'm surviving. I don't, I don't want to open that up. And so it's very, we had a lot of healing to do. And then to keep in the relationship with the family about their lived experience and supporting families and parents in an ongoing way around what they say they need and they're active to say what they need, really can start to unfurl what you're saying so they can see the possibilities in their child. We, I have one uh, doctor who works with children with medical complexity, and we just said, why didn't, you know, he just started asking the child whether, no matter what was going on, whether they had anything that they wanted to do or be. And the child would just light up and they had already before just kind of didn't talk to the child, never talked to the family about what do you want to have happen? Like, I want to get my kid on a plane long enough to go see their grandparents before they die. And then every, all the care got oriented around that positive goal. So mm -hmm. when you identify the positive aspiration and the positive possibility, you're still dealing with all the issues and the problems, but you're doing it through the lens of what you're enthusiastic about, one of your, what you're inspiring to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, that, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, God, there's so much to say, but I'll, I'll move to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you, uh, you work at the intersection of innovations in healing and policy to lay the groundwork so that, so what works can begin to be paid for by insurance and used more widely. Mm -hmm. What possibilities are there for this work? And I don't, you know, can be your work, can be my work, can be all of us doing, you know, alternative mm -hmm. integrity, integrative and 
Mm -hmm. brain-based, uh, neuroplasticity-based work to be integrated into our existing health systems, especially for those children and people who need it the most, but may lack resources or ability. Yeah. yeah, it's really hard because there actually are a lot of things that are helping families. And even now, things like mindfulness, stress reduction, based stress reduction and more um, mind-body approaches and non-force body things that, you know, start to look a lot like what you're doing are paid for, but they're paid for by name, like this program and that program and this program and that program. And it's really not going to work that way because um, also a lot of these strategies are need to be adapted for each child and oftentimes in real time. So it doesn't really lend itself to these randomized trials that control all the factors so much. In fact, it's a complex system you're working with. You have to be flexible and adaptable to even help the child. And so how can you track what you're doing when you're in a flexible, adaptable intervention itself, right? And so I think that what we can do is start to look at common elements and, um, and common outcomes. And then when we track those, you may need to be using diff different kinds of elements so that then there's payment for approaches that engage these kind of sort of attributes of intervention, not necessarily the nurse, it has to be this thing. And so I think that that's one way to free that up. And, you know, I think also there's a lot of uh, demonstration projects that are going on around the country and states that are opening the door to these more comprehensive um, alternative approaches. And my research on complementary and alternative medicines, I did do a study with the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which has a different name now. And what I noticed was that um, the common denominator for all families that were getting actually getting their kids into care was that they had already been through the health system and through the ringer. The cost of care they had prior to getting complimentary services was so high. They'd been to every doctor they could think of and finally ended up at the doorstep of somebody who looked at them like a whole person. And just having that opened up intelligence about what was going on and what was needed and so a part of these alternative approaches is what they have in common is they're looking at the whole person and they're working with what is alive to be met and moved for with the child and family, where is their engagement? And so you're engaging them and then moving with them the way that I see your work doing as an art, it's like a dance. And so that whole neurobiological mo neuro movement approach is common. It, when things work, I think that's what's happening is we're engaged in the way you train uh, families and moving, you know, the movement part is a specific piece. But so I think this common elements, common intervention, common elements approach that can use common outcomes measures to track inputs is going to be hopefully a way we can go. Mm -hmm. And also creating um, payment models that allow uh, providers and health plans and systems to pay for what works rather than pay for, so just writing something today for the California governor's uh, initiative on looking at adverse childhood experiences and how they have to change the coding so they can code for things like developmental trauma rather than having to diagnose every kid with ADHD because the symptoms are very similar is what happens when a child has um, developmental trauma. And so those sorts of things are starting to happen, but the payment models give the opportunity for a doctor to say, okay, I don't have to only get paid to do this medical, this medication for you or this procedure. I can actually pay for what help you get and pay for in our bundled payment, if you will, or global payment for all of my population the Anat Baniel method, because I've seen several of my patients. And in fact, when I went to Stanford and I work with colleagues at Stanford, they send patients to you. Mm -hmm. And you, I didn't even know that, but they're sending pay because the families are coming in and because we're basing that metric on the experience of the family and the child, mm -hmm. that's the common element metric. So no matter what you're doing, you keep measuring what's happening for people. And then you notice the learning coming up. I call it launch and learn. And they just started noticing and they had a payment model that allowed them to be flexible. And so, you know, I think, I think it's coming. It's the hardest thing. And for me, my heart breaks for the families and children that I know with 
probably because we're so exquisitely sensitive to the positive, our bodies and our brains know when it's going in the right direction. And, but it needs the skills and training. It needs these competencies to be scaled really as a matter of public health, I think. Um, and it's, it's moving, but it's, it's difficult. And so for vulnerable populations, I think we need, you know, to really, um, you know, basically create a national agenda to try to engage a process to, re to make sure those resources are available for them. But part of the problem you would face is that you would be so swamped that you would be able to meet the need. So this is really where a lot of innovations hit the wall is as soon as they get attention, they can't meet the capacity. And so you're doing great by putting out trainings online and empowering and families. And, and yeah. we have seven, 800 practitioners right now. Right. And so it's really possible to scale it now. And if you get in with being outcomes oriented, and I'm not talking about ultimate outcomes, but outcomes like uh, real more positive health outcomes. I mean, this is all about the outcomes. I mean, and the outcomes are like second by second, let alone the bigger yes. outcomes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I get so inspired listening to you and and for me, you're such a magical occurrence in the universe because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Until I met you and, mm -hmm. and got a little more familiar with your universe, it took me a while. Mm -hmm. For me, anything that had to do with bureaucracy or institution, yeah. I just shut down because I, I couldn't make sense of them. And I would just get anxious. And it, I knew it just stopped me, my spirit, my brain, my intelligence, my passion. So I left academia. I did well in academia in terms of my own accomplishments, but it was, I just had to leave. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I never expected to, to start funneling into the institutionalized or the, you know, generalized through, through, uh, you know, policy and stuff, but you come from where you come and you are impacting the policy to start matching where you come yeah. from, where I come from, from where other practitioners are coming from. Mm -hmm. I, I really would love to reconnect you with the Dr. Martha Herbert. They, they mm -hmm. just are, they've gone through a big, it started as a film project. I, I think they also have the film, but it moved into a research project that really you, she has slightly different terminology, but it's called, you'll understand it from the, the wording, documenting hope. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and taking, and her interest is the different modalities that mm -hmm. each has its own way to accomplish. And it's a whole person, all of those modalities yeah. are a person and they, they are close to getting their I, IRB. It's a, yeah. they have to take it back and this work. This is great. This is really great. I would say that one of the other things, though, that I mean, the reason, first of all, I'm an accidental academic and I have been duly traumatized. And the reason that I think I've made it through is I do work that's extremely quantitative and you can't really like just blow me off as a California girl interested in silly things because I measure it and get data on it and do that. But I will say that it's a traumatized system that can't see itself. And so if you, if you, I look at systems as like, as you were look at like a body or a person. Mm -hmm. And so if you apply the essentials, which I do in some of the work I do around facilitating systems change processes, where we bring schools and health systems and communities together at all levels and um, basically download what's been. So we kind of get a sense of, you know, allowing what is not being spoken into the field. So whatever's absent needs to be made present because it has all the control. And these are real systems change models. But when I when we go through these models to then activate the creativity, the real generativity rather than the habituated, which that's all we're doing is habituating as long as we're in fear. Um, basically all your essentials come into play. So I've 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 do talks and teach this and I can do the math. I've actually have a few times actually done the crosswalk between your essentials and what is required for effective systems change. And so I keep reminding myself that when it's that traumatizing, it's because it's very traumatized system. It has to be half three quarters of what makes up human health is completely cut off 
and the people themselves aren't treated as people. And so that's changing. But believe it or not, a lot of it's changing because we're starting to pay differently for healthcare. Oh, I, I totally, I yeah. totally understand that. You know, one of the things is the, the, you know, the work with children and, and I, I started thinking about it. Of course, COVID makes it kind of difficult mm -hmm. because we can't, but to start, you know, using the nonprofit and start bringing the work to right. more challenged populations and less affluent populations. I would just love to create like a blue zone for children and families where we bring all we can to them. And especially where we can just see the changes within a week, there would be miracles, I think, happening oh. because that's the power we have. And it won't be high tech, but it will be very I, sophisticated. I, 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 I have to say to you, you know, we I did an interview with Dr. Michael Merzenich a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. three days ago, whenever that was, I don't remember, but it doesn't matter. And um, and he he talked also during the interview, but afterwards we kept talking for about an hour. And he said, you know, your problem is that when people go to your center, there are no machines. Right. And and there's no like fancy machines. So nobody believes you do really powerful stuff because where are the machines? I burst into laughing so hard, never even occurred right. to me that it could be a problem. Well, I know. Well, that's why I call it, we are the medicine. And I used to call it only privately that. And then I, I was here, when I came here to Hopkins, the Dean of the School of Public Health asked me to give my presentation, having been, they recruited me here. And I gave my talk and I gave him two choices. And one was very scientifically sounding and, you know, it was very in depth. And the other was, we are the medicine. And then it was similar to the title for this. And he said, I want that one. And so I went for it. And it was really bringing all the streams of science together, neuroscience, epigenetics, uh, attachment, resilience, with what we know about our requirements for well-being show the opportunity, the variation and positive deviance. So we have a lot of positive outcomes where we don't expect them. And that's where you can be really curious. And it's always coming down to these common themes that align perfectly with your nine essentials. So we are the medicine. Actually, we're the first, in, we're the first screening tool. We're the first intervention ourselves. And that is something that's really resonating. And when I testified in Congress, um, it was the first time we had a congressional hearing on the impacts, long lasting impacts on the whole population of adverse childhood experiences and the opportunity for healing. That was what was most interesting to people. And now we have all the science around microglial cells, which is brain inflammation impacting the brains of children and families that can be regulated but it's regulated through the processes very similar to what you're doing. So we can reduce inflammation. All of a sudden schizophrenia symptoms are gone. And the, so the field is blowing up. We need lots of work to integrate it and translate it to meaningful work. That's hard, you know, even for stroke where we have a lot of reasons to understand it, we have to really put it down to the very big details. Yeah, and you know, with the stroke, we, we have to wait again till COVID would allow to reopen it. Mm -hmm. But we're almost done with the re research proposal and, the, and part of what slowed it down. Oh, is, great. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. I, hey, hello. I'm glad we're talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, we're building actually a manual mm -hmm. for practitioners. First, it'll be ABM, you know, neural movement pr trained practitioners. But we're building it so that we can then train physical therapists or occupational right. therapists without them having to take a full ABM training. Yeah. yeah. And, and but it's kind of like it was a very I I, I loved it and you know my, Neil Neil and I worked on the content and and then you know the conceptualization everything together with Martha very closely and the 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 wow, you see, you're amazing <laughs> well. Look who is talking. Anyway, but <laughs> but the thing is that the work by nature is could, through re relational into right. a very complex system. And the idea, right. the basic idea, you you go with the system. You find right. you meet it where it is, and right. then you start using the essentials, right? You give it an opportunity right. to find home and start growing, right? right. 
So stroke is stroke is stroke, but then every stroke patient is different. They were different before they had the stroke. They have slightly a different stroke and they're coming out with some typical symptoms, but they are not, but the person that has to heal is different than the other person. Yeah. So there's the, the, so we are a nonlinear system. We have a very rich pool of options that we pull right. on, on this uh, moment by moment. So we build, I don't remember how Martha called it. She comes up with these fantastic titles, but it's like a tree, a dynamic tree. So right. you say person uh, uh, cannot sit up or we, we prefer people for many reasons uh, to, to lie down first anyway. But if X happens, you go to X1. If Y happens, you go to Y. But in X1, there could be X1A, X1B, X1C, X1D. Right. Basically, we build a tree that gives paths for the practitioner, but the number of combination becomes very large. Yeah, exactly. So well, that's where you have to, at some point, you get, you go with your there's, it's you say instincts, but instincts actually, I think, are no, it's very just, informed yeah, with well, more yeah. information. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, we call it, most people call it intuition, and people have very little intuition in areas they know nothing about. People always have the best intuition in areas they're very experienced in. So, mm -hmm. so you can call it intuition, but I call it use your feeling and your knowledge, and then you mm -hmm. do it gently, you test it, it works, you keep going, it doesn't, you do something else. Mm -hmm. So, so. And, and for me, I wanted to start with stroke because it's so straightforward from my mm -hmm. point of view, even yeah. if it can be complex in terms of the impact on the brain. And, and, and it's so predictable, the limitations that are created due to the type of intervention that they get. Because if you really understand how the brain forms itself, you can predict the limitations that are formed, mm -hmm. not just the possibility for success. I mean, it's totally predictable and it, you know, I go a little cookie because I don't see how other people don't see it, you know? Right. But I think that once we create, do the research and create, and I think within three, depends how many subjects we can get within a period of a few months, I think within half a year, yeah. you know, we could start training, if we, assuming we'll get positive results, very, very large number of people. Yeah. And, I think so too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I want to, I want to share something kind of wacky with you because, um, you know, you work with the body, right. And the importance in, of the body and the movement. And there's something in these systems change efforts called social presencing theater. That's being used more and more with groups of like leaders, CEOs of companies, and they're letting people do it where you use the body to just you know, take a physical position of what the problem is and then take a physical position of what you feel the possibilities are and then take a physical position of what you think the seat, the solution is. And you don't think about the words, you just do it. And then other people start joining in and as a group, they make like a, like a social structure from their bodies. And then they basically consult afterwards. Um, using some of these principles of connecting and fixing, slowing, and the innovation that is coming out and the way people are cutting right through to build trust and, and really understand each other is, is so rapid through the, the voice of the body. And so I just had to, of course, we know this in dance. So I yeah. just wanted to share that with you. It's pretty yeah. amazing to see. Yeah, I, it's fantastic, you know, and I, I heard it, a little bit about it from you, you know, just a few weeks ago for the first time. What I want to point out here is I don't feel like I work with the body. I feel I work with a person. And right. you know, I don't separate, you know, it's like I, you cannot have a, a thought without your body being part of it. Yeah. And so on and so forth. And it's, it's so it's really one system and it emerges it, it expresses itself in, in, in different facets, but, mm -hmm. but, it's, but what, yeah. uh, one of the things I've seen it is we have been, especially, you know, smart, academic, uh, high-performing people, we've been trained to be really powerful with our logical linear me mechanisms of thought. Mm -hmm. And it's very powerful. That's one of the reasons it's so useful for people. But one of the things that, that happens with it, there's either a complete forgetfulness or a looking down at a whole other way of knowing 
and see, feeling and understanding and, and getting it, so to speak, that is nonverbal, at least initially, and is brilliant. And, and what you're describing for me is like people are, you know, big CEOs and stuff, giving themselves permission to be maybe silly and go and connect to, to right. the richest resource within themselves. Well, they, some of them would say they're, they've never had experience of presence or certainly a, a feeling that someone else was present with them. So my theory is that when you get that, it, like you said, it opens the learning switch when you actually go from fixing to connecting but it, yeah, because but there's an intelligence that emerges and then all of a sudden yeah. something is available. It's organic learning. It's learning right. that it's is organic connected learning. to you, you, where you right. are, how you are. And mm -hmm. everybody that became a functioning adult had to do that enough to get to be a functioning adult. But as we get more socialized and then we get professional and we make money and all that stuff, many people uh, uh, lose access to it, uh, yeah. you know, completely. Uh, and and or or maybe remember it a little bit, but don't know how to reconnect and utilize it. So it's wonderful what you described. I'm I I just want to Neil texted me as we were talking, and told me that Martha is on the call. Oh, fantastic! So so wow, Martha. Martha. <laughs> yeah, get, get her in here. Yeah. Yeah. So like, just a few minutes, Martha. If you can just want to say anything, I'd love for you to say and kind of whatever you want, any comments you want to make, and then I want to move to one or two more questions, and then open it to everybody else and are you okay staying another 10 15 minutes past the hour or is that too yeah. late for you i'm good I'm okay good. so where, right. where's martha i'm here can you see me or i can me? see you martha i i will i don't yet but uh, is it the bottom you might not see her down there okay well, we, oh I, I i'm trying to do speaker view so martha why don't You'll you see her when she speaks yeah okay Christine, oh, you yeah. and I met. I don't know if you remember. And we did. I do remember. In my in my house, I remember. Yes. Yeah, we also met in the um, pediatric academic um, society meeting in 2015 with Martha Welch, who's a really good friend of mine. Oh my gosh, Martha! Yes, Martha Welch is amazing, and a lot of my work is to try to bring the her emotional connection screener into pediatrics. Right, and when you were talking earlier, I'm like, oh my god, no wonder. Yeah, you know, we used your work in writing our our IRBs for our pro project. We have a <laughs> there's an there's a nonprofit called Epidemic Answers, and we have a yeah. extensive. Sir, I don't know. Do you know about that? I do. I do, I do, and I I would love. To, <laughs> I need to join. It's really kind of lonely here. I need to be a part of like your group, so we should talk more. But well, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm so happy thing, to hear that. The main thing I want to talk about just in the moments now is. I would like for you to help us both, both the documenting hope and what's going on in our work in ABM. And they're really so comparable with each other at the, at the conceptual level. Um, and, and you articulated a lot of what that's about, but you talked about common metrics. Yeah. I wanna, I'm, I'm planning with Joyce Cameron, who's also on the call to build a case registry for yeah. ABM because one of yeah. the problems, and we looked at that in stroke, is that a lot of the standardized metrics sealing out way below the level of transformation that people undergo. Oh, totally. Yeah. And 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 so and we've been talking about that a lot in documenting hope and we talked about it a lot in developing the stroke project and it'll apply in the in the registry and a variety of other things. And so right. I would love it if you would help us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, what I really, this is part of what I was saying to you and not that those common elements, common metrics, and there needs to be some work for that, but I only see it now that there might be some funding to do it right. So when we did the special healthcare needs screener that's now used in every national survey and health plan assessments, and we have data, was because we took some time to really envision and think through it, and then it can go fast. It can go faster for me now because I kind of know how to fast track measurement development and validation, but it's always based on what you're trying to do. And it's a totally different frame of pos prom pos the proactive promotion of positive health and capacity and potential. 
Well, I would love oh, that. Where are you now? Oh, you skipped over there. <laughs> I'm moving around. She's well, skipping around on the board. <laughs> I just think it's, I mean, we can't really do that now, but if we could just agree to do it, that would be mm -hmm. fantastic because I don't like fishing through metrics that are that are really not going to do the job. It's, it, it's at some point I'm like, why are we doing this? And we've yeah. been, we built qualitative research into yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it, you, you really are onto a whole lot more than that. So that and, and part of what I do too, is because so much of the information you need is from people. And that's always been true. The way we find out about functioning, just burden of illness, symptoms, well-being, any of those things have to come from people. It's creating really patient and family friendly resources for them to go online and reflect on. So for them, it looks like an engagement tool where they're reflecting on things. And that's called what we call screening. And they're identifying their needs and priorities, which mm -hmm. you know we call something else. And then they uh, select their priorities, they get a visit guide, it gets to the doctor, the team, then they're sitting down together, already engaged around what's most important, but the screening that you need to do and the positive um, attributes and strengths are there as well. And so getting that data to the table before encounters so that you can have a whole person, whole child, whole family dialogue is part of what we're trying to do as well. But it puts the power in the hand of, of the parent where they own their data and they get to the end of one of our tools, they can send it to whoever they want, their specialist, their not, whoever, but they're, they're, it's basically their story of a whole view of their family and their child so that care is based on the foundation of that kind of information. But that's where you can put a lot of metrics at different places, um, but you collect the data so it's not a burden on families. It's actually something they're looking forward to sharing as well because they're also engaged in learning with you. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we can talk more about that, but I think how the collection of data itself is an intervention, I think, because it creates awareness and reflection. By the way, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. that's become a big, big tool in my work. I just, also just with children, as young as, you know, a few months old, you know, even if they don't fully understand, but certainly a little older, do you yeah. know that, oh, you're doing this. Did you know you're doing it? Do you right. want to do this? Yeah. And you know, and it's just like the brain just pops into a completely yeah. different function. The, the, the healthy alert system and feedback loop we need, right? And, and, I have I'm, my policy platform at the end of it. I talk about my six wishes and basically I, they're all neuroscience informed. And, you know, basically the first one's free our brilliance by aligning our payment with our values for health and then take on transparency to be more curious and afraid to get feedback all the time. And that's what you're talking about is, is getting, wanting it because you need it and you like it. It's like, oh, it didn't work as well that time. I wonder what I did differently. And then it becomes a, exactly. a yeah. living and a living thing. Yeah, totally. But yes, Martha, absolutely. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Wonderful. I'm so happy you're on the call, Martha. <laughs> I'm just have missed this. I'm... Where's Jill? I saw Jill too. She's I here thought. somewhere. She was here. Oh, Where's she's... Jill? Is she still on? She has a, a storm happening. She's on a boat somewhere in the. I sea. am. I'm here. Oh, I'm in where the are you? Can can we can we pin her? Where Hi. are you? Oops. Oh, here you are. Light on. You're in the dark. Yes, I'm in the dark. <laughs> so so good to see you again. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, wow, I mean, that was a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Um, and all of it, I mean, all of it, uh, it resonated really well with how I think about the two hemispheres and the availability of part of our emotional system and the lack of availability or fear of the other. I mean, it was just really, really beautiful conversation tonight. Thank you. We're not done. Thank you, Jill. Jill, I have it. I'm not done. I'm just so yeah, inspired. She's not done with you, Jill. <laughs> or, with, <laughs> or with anybody. I mean, I'm so inspired, all of you, you know, most of the audience, but the three of you, I just, I, I have to hold myself back from crying. I'm just so moved. I am so at the presence of how amazing my life is because I know you and I can do things <laughs> with you. I mean, this is like, Talk about being in the presence of the good, you know, it's amazing. Jill, this is, say a complete no if you want, want to, but when Christina was talking earlier, 
I thought a little bit about your childhood. Yes. Yeah, you know, anything that it brought to you about that or anything novel or or you rather uh, talk about it right now? I, I think, uh, you know, the, when, when the words passed by, uh, inflammation and getting rid of inflammation clears up signs of schizophrenia. Boy, did that get my attention. Yeah, yeah. But because of your brother, right? Of that, course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 the, the devastation of of seeing a, a, a somebody in your family that is not basically getting better. Yeah, well, yes, and just predictably not going to get better, and um, and isn't going to help himself even if we came up with tools that we could use in order to help him get better. Yeah. Which is what I was also saying is activating the will to be well, and that self agency is one of the biggest issues. Yeah, yeah well, he, he, he's way too attached to his holy father. You know, there's uh, when you have direct line of communication with Jesus, it's going to take a whole lot more than the idea of wellness to make you want to get rid of Jesus. Well, that's intense. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> intense. But you know, apropos agency, and maybe there are two things that maybe we can bring on and then go. Thank you, Jill, and thanks for coming on, and thanks for being on. Yes. Uh, but the 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 uh, one of the things that I observe in, in quite a few of the interventions, both with children and adults, is that the intervention kills off agency okay. uh, and, and, and sort of numbs the brain and creates very limited grooving. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is something that maybe yeah. Even as we well, I I would love to speak to that. Even in yeah. even in preventive services for well well child care, only half of parents in California, for example, actually bring their kids in to services that are paid for that are meant to be the place where we teach them about whole whole health and all this relational health issues and stress management and so on. And when we try to work with a certain populations, especially the Hispanic Spanish speaking population, which is a huge portion of children and families, they, the first response is, well, why should I tell my doctor about my life and what I want? Isn't he supposed to tell me or she supposed to tell me? Huh. And so we haven't, we have 126 schools that teach you how to be a doctor, but none that teach you how to be a patient or a person interacting on your behalf. So I agree with you there. And it's really important to to do that. But one of the things I point out is, you know, Jill, even with your brother, you know, it's possible to flourish with illness, right? The studies are very clear that adults with a lot of illness can still flourish in terms of defining it as being engaged in life. Uh, maybe it's engagement in a way we don't think is, but they're engaged. They have a sense of meaning. They can stay related somewhere how and have something that they do that actually makes them feel like they matter. So these kind of things. And when we build those qualities in people with lots and lots of illness, they're like eight times less likely to die with a similar as a, from a similar person with the same illness that doesn't have it. So we can help as a dual continuum and we can have illness and well-being at the same time. And so if we think about it that way, we get busy proactively promoting. And I think that's really not how I, I see it is you're promoting possibility and, 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 and then things are getting better and better. And in your case, it also really impacts the brain and the body of the children. But even when that's not possible, it's still having a big benefit. Christina, I got a text that you should, we uh, would like you to hold your microphone again. Oh, okay. And Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. And I would like to open it if people have questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, you know, if it's okay for you, maybe Neil can moderate the, the questions or do you want to read them? Because he can. No, let them. Neil do it. And he can ask any of us, right? Questions? Well, uh, we're going to primarily focus on you, darling. Okay. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I've got one from Gabby here. Um, first of all, I can't express in words how enthusi I, enthusiastic I am by what has been discussed here. It's so exciting to see how far this work can go in the scope of public health, education, all the way 
to the interpersonal family level of parent-child attachment. Yeah. Here are my questions. How can we be effective advocates for our children who are doing ABM in the context of mainstream medicine that treats the child very differently? And how can we as parents... Maybe tell you one at a time. Okay. Okay. So for that, I think you have science on your side. And often the providers you're seeing don't know the science. And so I think there's ways, you know, what, what I often do is I put resources together for families so they can be advocates. That's actually a lot of how we got the Family Medical Leave Act passed because uh, they brought their story together with data. And so when you bring a story together with some data or research, often that can really help. But there are more and more providers out there who, and doctors out there who are beginning to understand. But I think that if there was something that a not you could do with families directly to actually give them some kind of information sheet, you know, that they could bring. So we have this work that we do on engaging families to promote positive development of young children by optimizing well visits. And we create this little way that they come in empowered with the information and it explains to them that what we're doing is guideline based it's based on the american academy of pediatrics guidelines just like your work is based on the core principles of neuroplasticity and you know and and health so i think that's really important the other is to actually start speaking up i don't know if you have um but if you haven't it's probably because there's a lot of trauma and fear in the relationship and so you know, to look at that. I mean, that's a lot of what our work is as well, is that for from fixing to connecting, like Anat said, if you have a provider that you don't feel you can share with who will listen and you have options, I think it's important for you to make sure you're with the right doctor, but otherwise to actually speak up and be, begin being coached. We've had to actually coach families, even in well child visits. How do I ask my doctor about toilet training? How do I ask my doctor about how I can help my child eat food that, you know, what's going on that they won't eat their food. They, they feel that like they're worried about sounding stupid or being shut down. And so I think that it could be with this work that there could be a little bit of some resources put together on, you know, how to bring this up, um, you know, and tips for actually we give families scripts and then they really appreciate it. They put it in their own words, but it's like, no, it's not stupid to bring this up. It's, it's actually really important. And, and that's the kind of bringing together the science with the story piece. So that's one part of what I think is really important. And the other is that um, one of the pieces I do is try to align these kind of innovations with what's already going on in the field. So what you probably don't know is that most pediatricians these days anyway are getting pushed to work on um, this issue of building resilience and dealing with toxic stress and how that is feeding a lot of the biologic neuroendocrine immune effects that children have that are exacerbating any underlying illness, the, the trauma of it, the stress of it. And so they're being asked to really find ways to help families. And so you may find there's a lot more receptivity and as they get paid for outcomes, also, if you're saying something's helping me and they, they start being one of those doctors that is looking at your well-being and flourishing and how the family's functioning as an outcome, that's one of the things Medicaid and the federal government is looking at now is even family belonging. A sense of belonging in the family is incredibly powerful if you look at the research. Um, so, so those are some ideas. I have more to say, but I think... If that didn't answer your question, I want to, I, you can ask it a different way, but I wanted to begin to give you some insight on what we might do. Okay, she has Thank a second. Thank you, Christina. Well, that, that sort of addresses part of the second part, so we'll go to another question, and maybe if she wants to come back yeah. to you, she can put something else in the chat. A question from Yari. I wonder if there are coping programs in NICUs and PICUs, mm -hmm. because even if I loved how caring the people there were, we only were given the raw data about my child and the worst possibilities. Yeah. We were lucky to have an amazing support system and only two days after the devastating news, I could connect to the mom of a seven-year-old child who suffered a similar neonatal stroke as my daughter. It was a, such a hope infusion. So I've yeah. always been a bit resentful we weren't given all the possibilities. How to stop doctors from thinking they're giving false hope. We just want to know all the possible outcomes. Yeah, no, it's like a huge blind spot. I think Jill said something about that. It's literally like amnesia of a whole reality. 
that all doctors know there's huge variation in how children do with similar experiences. They all know that, they see it every day. They're afraid they're gonna get sued if they give you hope and it doesn't happen. They're, this is really, really crazy, right? A lot of things that are driving them is fear. So in a way, I'm gonna say something kind of radical, which is the how you are with the doctor actually may make a difference on their ability to open up their own brains to the possibility frontier. <laughs> and because they do know this, but there's a lot of fear they have. And then when you're in front of them because they actually want you to be okay and they can see you're not okay, it actually triggers them into their own fear trauma response. Now it is not your responsibility to do that emotional labor for a doctor. However, if you can be as grounded as possible using some of the tools that Anat has been teaching, you may find that there's a different way that they um, respond. The other is um, there are studies in the PICU and NICU, and in fact, um, where families are being brought in to care for the child, to be the one to do the procedures or help put the lines in and clean the lines and things like that for the baby. And they're finding huge impacts on the regulation of the body of the baby and the well being of the parents. And so these, these models are out there in research. Unfortunately, we have a crazy academic system where if you Google it, you can't get the data. You can get you can get the abstract, but you can't get the article. So if you see an article, let me know and I'll get it for you because I can get them all. But it's really hard to see it and then the synthesis of it. So we're getting research going on for sure. That's family engaged, engaging families in the care of their child and then being um, and then seeing effects, positive effects through that nurturance and care and connection the child's body is actually improving. And so it, the, the science is exploding where we even know mom's stress levels impact the brain size of a fetus. And so we know that that relational way that we are with each other and how we're able to hold and contain emotions and communicate is real. And it's very stressful. So, so the, I guess there is some, and I would love to, <laughs> to share more with you, but I don't have all my research references on the board, on board right now. But yeah, the oh, NICU that is, NICU. That's, uh, that's already amazing. And of course, we, you know, we, we, you sent me a lot of really interesting papers and we will put them next to the podcast as resources and mm -hmm. any other resources that you might want after this conversation, mm -hmm. just email it to me and Neil and we'll just edit and there'll be by the podcast, a resource section that comes from you. So yeah. Wonderful. And I do want to say that for the NICU graduates, it's a huge amount of money nationally. And there's supposed to be eight visits after for the families after they graduate from the NICU that almost never happen. And they're solely focused on supporting the family and getting through the trauma of the time and bringing them into a place of possibility and restoration. And they don't happen because they're not putting that priority, like you said, but there's a lot of people trying to change that. And you know, it's really meant to keep families together. There's a huge amount of divorce that happens with families of children who are born premature and it has lifelong effects on everyone. So the damage is huge to not attend to these issues and the science is on our side. So there isn't a role for advocacy. That's why I work with family voices. We get laws passed, things change. You have power for sure. Just speaking, you have power. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. Let's see uh, one, a, a, uh, uh, I'm just trying to select some. Uh, okay, Th that might be interesting. There are a multitude who need and ask for help. How does one access help for those who don't believe they need it? <laughs> My grandson, now 25, was repeatedly traumatized from birth till now and feels it and says he's fine. You're so familiar with this topic. <laughs> yeah, it's Christina. But both my daughter and grandson need help, except they don't think they need it. What can one do to encourage them to seek help? Wow, wow, wow. And well, that's, there's lots of books out there on these things. I grew up with them. Um, uh, two parents who were, had this phenomenon going on, um, lots of trauma. And I spent a lot of time trying to inspire them and encourage them. 
And my mom was dying in hospice. And she even said, I hated the sound of your voice. You just kept trying to encourage me. Maybe if you just stopped trying to convince me, it would have been better. I would have just gotten up and done something. Of course, that's not a really nice thing to say, but it is important to understand that people have to be enthusiastic about themselves. And I think this is a, not, a lot of a not what you do, because I see you work with children who have been coddled in some way and not that they weren't, I don't, want to, I, don't want, I don't mean that to be a negative thing, but they didn't get entered into their own idea of the possibilities for themselves in a way that didn't feel like someone was caring for them. So their agency wasn't activated. And so sometimes the only way to activate agency in people is to look at how you might be being codependent with them and not giving them a chance to, you know, how you walk as you fall down, you learn to walk by falling down and then you get creative and learn. And so there is that piece that can be very, very much a dynamic in families and it's a slow learning, but that's one piece, but suddenly someone has to feel in their body, a possibility and then a trust with whoever is doing that. So really what a not teaching about really connecting. You can connect with a person no matter where they are. Even if they're in a slump, you can be there with your own presence. And that, you know, I think we don't do that. We want to go, don't get out of your slump. Come on over here, be different. And so this whole fixing to connecting taken to a radical level, I think you find that I really think a, not, a lot of what your work is, is helping people build that will to be well, that agency for themselves. It's it's a, I think it's more than will to be, not even, in my world, it's not a will. It's like, it's just something that they comes in and out of them. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like, I see it as life force, basically. Yes, it's life force, but it, 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 I'm just saying it, it shows up on the outside as, yeah, yeah, as some yeah. action suddenly that's being Maybe, taken yeah, that wasn't absolutely. being taken before. And you know, I'm going to, I'm going to plug here some, some, and I love how you said it in straight and you didn't, you know, sugarcoat it. So thank you so much for doing it that way. And it's not simple to do because even if somebody decides not to be what's called codependent or, you know, overstep into the other person's space and so on, it's very, very hard to do. It, it yeah. takes a, actually personal training and elaboration and growth to even know that we are doing it when we are doing it, let alone be able to do better or differently. And here, I really want to recommend Byron Katie, the COVID-19, Byron Katie, just go to, uh, she calls uh, her, her work, thework.com, or you go to Byron Katie and COVID uh, pandemic, she's amazing. You can, she has books, you can read about her. I'm not going to go into any details what she does, um, but she's developed a mechanism of getting people what she calls to stop suffering or home to themselves in her own very unique way and gives tools for people to learn gradually, you know, how to do it. And be, when the pandemic started, uh, uh, Katie uh, started four times a week, and if you don't have money, you can even go zero dollars and do it an hour between nine and ten Pacific daytime, and then on Thursday she also adds another one that's two hours, and you have to pay something. So, um, and and you can just do it. I, I'm very busy. Very often I just put my, my phone and I record it. You know, people can't reach me for an hour at a time or two hours at a time. So when I hike, I can listen to her work. She is magnificent and she does not sugarcoat, but she, she's just so skillful and so good at doing what she's doing. And I think, you know, I brought her to my center once and she did a little thing in the center, but I think all of us could benefit from her. And certainly parents with their children yeah. or especially parents with children special needs so so that is just like a plug-in here by our own case yeah. well i i'd love to just say one more thing about this because i think it's so important to the well-being of, of families and parents of children with special needs or 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 a family or a friend of anybody who is in that situation of suffering you know there's something that could help they're not receptive or the microphone or moving toward it. And, you know, for me in the work with Byron Katie, I came to stop pathologizing my grief that really was born of my love. And I was like, I kept trying to fix, say my mom or my sister um, who had those 
my sister's better now, but for a long time, not. And, but I, if I, it, because I, I was suffering, but if I say it's okay for me to grieve when someone I love is suffering and not helping themselves. And if I make space for that, then I can keep all the good too. But if I don't make space for it and the feelings, if you don't make space, I think for what's at, if you're absencing what's true and you don't let it have space in you, I think it really weighs down. And I know I'm pretty sure it has huge neurobiological impacts. So I think opening up the possibility that my life contains this, this grief, but I don't let it overwhelm me, but I also don't deny it. And you can feel the pain and still be okay. It's really that flourishing amid adversity capacity. And, and for me, the more I try not to feel it, and judge myself what should be different they should be different I should be different I shouldn't hurt I should just be okay and and just say but this is what it is and is it okay that it is that way and then maybe it will change so to not try to not feel what is normal to feel when the person you love suffers but not let it keep you from you know seeing the possibility and staying in your own agency thank you so much it's so beautiful you know I say Briefly, when I work with people in general and most kind of clears with the children, I, I somehow never suffer myself. I perceive the suffering fathers because I really connect to the child. And the child is fine. Unless they have some pain, they're fine. You know, so there's a way of connecting with another mm -hmm. person and having the joy of of being with them and so on while other things are happening. But the, we, we don't normally get to it because we decide to. So it's really great to have an mitigating mechanisms. And there are many different methods that work on it. I just think Byron Katie is so simple, yeah. you know, seemingly simple and accessible. We, we also know that the part of the brain that decides to do something and the part of the brain that actually executes on it, I think might be different. And they can get disconnected a little bit with trauma and, and so on and so forth. So sometimes it's actually, there's actually something going on. And, and to the extent that your work and not helps heal brains, oh, that yes. should get better. <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah, well, it always gets better. I mean, I, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but that's another, another podcast. So, right. yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, but it's, it's so inspiring. I mean, and I, one of the things that I personally so inspiring for me, just talking to you today is how much you have, you know, you have all the aspects, you know, the personal and the ins inspirational and the data, 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 and the courage. I mean, you are, you know, you're incredibly courageous. In just in I, I see you as incredibly courageous. <laughs> and you started when you were 15. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and you even got the was, was it the uh, Kennedy Angels Award or what's the award that you Oh, got? Family Voices, the group that represents families of children with special health care needs nationally, gives out a uh, National Angel Award every year. And they give one to a senator uh, and one to a, a public citizen. And I won the National Angel Award the year Ted Kennedy did. So we were at the Capitol together and there was lots of media. And I thought, oh, it's for me. It's not, it was for him. <laughs> but I basically, it was because I put children with special health care needs on the map because of the work we did to really formulate a family-driven approach to identification and performance measurement that made the case that they actually got laws passed. There's a lot that's happened because of that. So that's what, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it's a matter. Yeah. Still is a reality. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, we have uh, with us uh, the whole time 50 people on the Zoom and, yeah. and, you know, we lost all the Europeans and Russians and all those people. Yeah. But it's also Facebook Live and it'll go out to thousands of people, sweetie. So oh, beautiful. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, so well, I'll try to log in and make sure I have to make sure I know how to do it in case people ask questions. Bye. And Martha, I'm excited to talk to you and Jill big hugs and there's work to be done yeah and when you talk to martha there's fun to be had let's put it that way fun to be when had you, when you talk to martha i'd love to be on the conversation of course it's possible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that'd be amazing and jill jill she's still on or did she leave i think she martha and jill are both still on great so martha, martha actually put a question in the chat oh. uh 
She said, I have a question about the drop in preemies during lockdown. That might be a question that could be a very long conversation. So you might want to take it offline. But I don't know if you have anything to say briefly about that. Well, I mean, iatrogenic illness is well known. <laughs> it could be that simpler, different approaches, lots more win midwives are taken over for sure. Relationship centered care has catapulted. I had two people on my staff have babies in the last couple of months, and they said the amount of love and care and attention that was being given to their births and in the when they were giving birth. So who knows if it's just really a lot more high quality that's happening, if that's what you're saying, that there was something in a drop. So I think these things really, we, we actually have research to show it, but I, I know that's happened. And even virtual care, there's still a lot happening with kids with special needs and the, the pediatricians that I work with who deal with kids with complex conditions say they feel more connected to the families because they're also seeing them in their environment. So there's, there's maybe some positive things that might come out of this time and their joy goes up. And the many doctors are burnt out because they're not really connecting. And that's what feeds us. Like I said, I believe our connection to ourselves, each other and life is the source of our joy and creativity. And we certainly need to, can restore that. And I think it's being restored a little bit through this COVID-19 time. So more to say there, but that's what came out this time of night for me. <laughs> okay. Well, Christina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. You're amazing. And, uh, and uh, we, you know, We'll have many more conversations and some of them will be in podcasts. Great. Okay. Bye-bye. So please, bye everybody bye. can unmute yourself and say thank you bye. and goodbye. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. So great to see you. you. And oh, what so an inspiring to way you. to finish your Absolutely talk. Absolutely fabulous. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. This was really thank great. You. Really a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the sharing and the, yeah. the possibilities. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Keep Light up where you are. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for joining us on Neuro Movement Revolution with Anab Benyel. You will find all of our podcasts and additional resources on our website at www.anatbenyelmethod.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast for free on iTunes iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. We look forward to seeing you online for our next Neuro Movement Revolution. <laughs>